parliamentlive.tv. That's significant. But the majority of the impact from the 110 measures, the additional £20 billion a year of business investment, won't feed through until after the five-year period. We think it's more likely to be over a decade that we'll see that £20 billion increase in business investment. So a lot of the measures I took were very long-term ones that will be both growth enhancing and debt reducing. Thank you. And on the debt question again, uh, the characterisation that the Office for Budget Responsibility had uh, of your fiscal rules yesterday was that they were the loosest of any of the six sets of fiscal rules that they've uh, seen chancellors ask them to evaluate um, over their existence. So would you accept that your fiscal rules are the loosest of any chancellor since the Office for Budget Responsibility was set up? Well, I think they've also said that I've had the tightest public finances of any chancellor that they've ever assessed. And we faced a truly exceptional situation last year, um, which I think uh, the markets accepted. If we'd stayed with the fiscal rules as they were, we would have had to consolidate in a way that would have been damaging for the long-term growth and indeed the long-term debt sustainability of the British economy. So I think it was the right decision to change those fiscal rules last year. Um, but I think what's important is having changed them, we stick to those rules and we demonstrate a responsible attitude to public finance. And what I was able to show at the autumn statement is that borrowing will be less uh, in the next five years than it was predicted to be in the spring budget. And debt as a proportion of GDP will end up being lower um, at the end of the five-year period than it was predicted to be in the spring budget. But you do accept they are looser? <coughs> you do accept they are looser than the ones you inherited? There was a, a loosening of the fiscal rules mm. a year ago, yes, in the mm. exceptional situation that we, had, we were facing. Um, I think that was the right judgment. But I think mm. it's also important to say that uh, as a result of the decisions I took in this year's autumn statement, um, we are overall in a situation where debt is lower than it was predicted to be in the spring budget. Indeed, that's the case for this year. Um, and of course, it's a rolling five-year uh, forecast that you're measuring your falling debt against. And I think it, if we looked at the, the previous, what was five years, now four years, actually debt is £4.9 billion higher than you thought it would be this time last year. So. Would you agree with the characterisation of your fiscal rules as they're, they're a bit like the manana fiscal rules? They keep just pushing things out for another year um, because it's a rolling five year. No, um, and I think when you look under the surface, what um, Torsten Bell said yesterday was uh, <coughs> relevant. He said to have a, a primary balance at uh, 2% is actually historically lower, a lower deficit than we've had uh, in the past and the reason that the overall debt isn't reduced further is because of the fact that uh, we have uh, the countervailing impact of the unwinding of the asset purchase facility that the Bank of England have. Now that is a temporary a yeah. phenomenon but I think the underlying picture is of public finances becoming much healthier over the next five years. But are you not worried about the fact that uh, interest payments have gone up so much this year and there is the potential uh, for them to uh, rise further. They're now uh, the highest debt servicing costs of any G7 economy. Well, they are £116 billion, and that's a lot of money. And that's why I think it is important to bear down on borrowing and important to have a plan to reduce debt. That's why I don't think it'd be right to increase borrowing by £28 billion a year, for example. Um, so I think we've taken policies that will allow us to reduce our debt and reduce our interest payments and in the five-year period we start to do that. Uh, you raised the question of the asset purchase facility and again uh, we discussed this yesterday with the Office for Budget Responsibility because they're now saying that the losses on the Bank of England's portfolio of gilts have uh, risen from 63 billion at the last estimate in July um, up to 126 billion now. 
how does that factor into your thinking in terms of uh, the, your ability uh, to spend? That must have an impact in terms of your real world budgeting. Well, it certainly has an impact on the, um, the debt numbers that we've just been discussing. But I think it's important to put it in the context that um, the profits made when quantitative easing was introduced uh, were between 2012 and 2022, 124 billion coming in the other direction. But they've from, been spent, haven't they? Well, they were coming from the Bank of England to yeah. the Treasury. And yeah. so uh, there's an unwinding process now that's happening um, as we go in the opposite direction. But you acknowledge that the money that came in has been spent. So well, the it, money that could potentially be losses, it could be a reduction in spending. Well, um, I reduction. acknowledge that uh, the two items broadly so far has balanced each other out, yes. Right, OK. Um, Chancellor, you and I both rebelled on uh, the decision uh, to reduce the international aid budget from 0.7 to 0.5. And uh, the Minister of State at the Foreign Office uh, was also a rebel in that. Uh, I believe that uh, the previous Prime Minister, now Lord Cameron, our Foreign Secretary, also was concerned about that. The world has not got uh, any more peaceful, uh, any more resilient uh, since that decision was taken. And yet I noticed that there are no provisions in the next five years to say that fiscal conditions allow and that you can return to 0.7. Is that your understanding of the situation? Um, I don't think the fiscal position uh, makes it possible to do that, but I, I would say this, that we are very committed to do that uh, when it is affordable to do so. And I fully share your judgment that, um, that the aid that we uh, do as a country is a very big statement of our values, uh, makes a very massive difference all around the world and absolutely I'm committed to returning to 0.7 when it's affordable to do so. But you're saying that in the next five years it's not affordable to, to do so based on the plans that you've outlined in the autumn statement? I don't believe it's possible to um, budget for that in the figures, no. In the next five years? Correct. Okay. Uh, John. Thank you. Um, my interest was declared in the register. Can I, can I thank you, Chancellor, for listening to my and this committee's representations regarding investment trusts um, and the cost disclosure rules that they're having to adhere to, which makes them look unduly expensive. These rules courtesy of overzealous regulation. You, you are fully aware of the importance of investment trusts. They have a third of the all FTSE 250 companies, four investment trusts are FTSE 100 companies. Uh, and this, because they look unduly expensive, this is putting off investment in areas like infrastructure, renewable energy, technology, areas that the government wants to encourage. At the time of the autumn statement, the Treasury published a draft SI, uh, statutory instrument, for technical comment on the um, UK retail disclosure framework. In part, it aims to deal with this issue of cost disclosure and investment trusts. Now, you're seeking comments by the 10th of January um, next year, how quickly after that deadline has passed will you be able to enact the SI? Um, I can't give you an exact date, Mr Barron, but um, can I first of all say that we recognise the urgency of this and um, we will uh, assess the responses that we've got to that consultation as quickly as we can and we are committed to resolving the issues. It's a very, very important sector worth 260 billion pounds. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. uh, the draft reg regulations to replace the, the PRIPS regulations that we inherited from the EU, accepting Rachel Kent's report on mm -hmm. um, the MIFID regulations, and we want to work at pace with the FCA to resolve this. Right. I'm, I'm delighted to hear because, I mean, you are fully aware that this sector has raised tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of pounds for these sorts of sectors we've discussed that the country needs investment in over the last decade. I mean, when it comes to that priority, that urgency, um, the intention, obviously, behind it, the SI, is for the, when it comes to the UK retail disclosure framework, is to move it out of legislation over to the FCA rule book. One gets that. Um, how quickly do you think the FCA is going to be ready to complete its consultation process for this move? And, and how is the Treasury applying a bit of gentle pressure? I know it's an independent regulator, but I know you have discussions at the same time. 
Well, all I can say is that there is a, is a joint commitment from the Treasury and the FCA to resolve this issue at pace. So um, we, we don't want to see any unnecessary delays. I am optimistic that we will be able to resolve it quickly, okay. um, even if I'm not able to give you No, no, you can't date. give me a timetable. I understand that. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for that assurance. The FCA is also considering interim solutions to mitigate the impacts of the investment company sector, investment trusts, in the short term. They themselves have um, said this. How close, to your knowledge, is, is the FCA to achieving this? And has the Treasury emphasised the urgency of those interim measures whilst the longer term solution is being considered? I don't have the answer to that, but I will happily write to the FCA um, and not just ask for that information, but also stress the importance of uh, doing these things quickly. Brilliant. And finally, on this issue, before I move to growth, the policy note that accompanied the draft SI uh, notes that there are also concerns about the requirements relevant to this issue set in the Markets in Financial Instruments Directive, commonly known as MIFID, um, and about EU retained law, and that a separate SI will come to repeal those provisions. Can you give us any guidance as to when we can expect that further SI, and will it also come as a draft statutory instrument? Um, that is my expectation, yes, um, and uh, indeed, like the other SI, I'm committed to doing this as quickly as possible. It was something I mentioned in my uh, mansion house reforms um, and again as part of the autumn statement process and uh, we are very keen to resolve the issues around MIFID quickly uh, because it's absolutely essential if we're going to get uh, more investment into our highest growth businesses mm -hmm. and a stronger research sector in, um, in the London market. Uh, and, and I think you're wise to do so. I mean the FCA has confirmed to us in writing that EU retained law is the problem as far as they're concerned. So what you're doing is providing them with a sufficient assurance to say we, you, know, we, you will have the legal legislative cover provided they come up with the regulatory solutions. And I think that's the sensible approach. Can I move us on, if I may, Chancellor, to growth and the impact of growth? Um, I just, just as a matter of interest, how difficult, how, how much more difficult does it make your job when you've got forecasters not always, how can I put it gently, getting it right when it comes to growth? I mean, you know, as, as, was, as I mentioned in PMQs today, you know, you've had the OBR and the ONS now admit or now say that the UK economy is significantly larger than it was from their estimates only a few months ago. The IMF over the last 28 forecasts for the UK economy has underestimated the strength of the British economy 25 out of those 28 times. I mean, you, you, you can't ignore the forecasters, but do, do you treat them with a pinch of salt? I, I think we, in fairness to forecasters, have to recognise that it has been a particularly volatile period. Um, and I don't think there are any forecasters that really have got it completely right. Um, I still think that um, it is better to have forecasts than not to have forecasts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you have to recognise the inherent volatility in the situation we face. And uh, sometimes that means that rather than rushing into a decision, you need to buy yourself time to find out exactly what's going to happen. What it certainly means um, is, and this was listening to some of the uh, global investors who came to the UK for the Global Investment Summit mm -hmm. on Monday, um, I think it's very foolish to predict that nothing bad is going to happen in the world no, over can't. the next 12 to 24 months and therefore you need to think about resilience in your approach to economic decision making. And when it comes to resilience, do you think one of the key litmus tests, not the only litmus test because there is a series of them, whether it be living standards, whether it be productivity, but certainly one of the key measures of how well an economy is doing is the employment rate. And, you know, we have record employment at the moment, an unemployment rate well below the EU average. It seems to be stable, at least for the time being. One can't be nonchalant or complacent about this, but that is, that is a, not a bad record to be looking into the future with, is it? Well, I'm very proud that unemployment has fallen by over a million since 2010. 
Um, but I am also concerned that with a million vacancies in the economy, we have six million mm. adults of working age who are not in work. And so I still think, uh, even though worklessness has gone down, uh, there is a lot of work to do to remove the barriers to work for people who are not in work, but many of whom say they would like to work. So that's why welfare reform was a big part of what we did. And it, it links to the broader, broader macroeconomic challenge that we have on inflation, which mm. has come down a lot, but is still not at target. Uh, the more we can ease labour supply for businesses, the more we reduce inflationary pressures. And is that one of the reasons you think that you, the government increased the, both the minimum wage and the living wage ahead of inflation to create a greater differential so in order to, whilst maintaining benefits in line with inflation, making sure nobody got left behind, creating a bigger differential to encourage people back into work at touch? Yes, I mean, I think that's a very important part of our overall strategy. If you look at the um, increase in take-home pay after tax of someone working full-time on the national living wage, which is uh, the lowest legally payable wage for mm. people over a certain age, um, you can see that has gone up in real terms by 30% since 2010. And I think that is very strongly connected to the fall in unemployment um, because uh, and it, the OBR themselves confirm that the 2p cut in national insurance from 12% to 10% will lead to just under 100,000 more people FTE equivalent in mm -hmm. the workforce which is the equivalent to filling one in 10 of those vacancies so it is absolutely central to our economic strategy. And finally following on from conversations yesterday with various economists and think tanks do you think also, by raising the minimum wages and living wage faster than inflation, you might encourage greater investment by companies to help the productivity issue? Because I would certainly contend that too many, certainly of the larger companies, has formerly relied on cheap labour as a substitute for investment. And my hope is that you know, this in part will at least help to put that right. Well, there is some evidence uh, from some economists of that happening, and I think Torsten Bell was talking about that mm. to the committee yesterday. Mm. Um, what I would say is that at the very minimum, um, what happens when you uh, increase the national living wage is that you make work worthwhile for more people. And most companies say the biggest constraint they have is not being able to recruit the staff they need to expand so at a minimum it does that but when you combine it with the other measures such as uh, full expensing mm. uh, which have given us the most attractive investment reliefs uh, in in the developed world mm. um, the intention is to give a massive boost to our investment and to our productivity and um, that is not just about increasing GDP. Um, I think I've had this discussion with the committee before about the importance of GDP per head and mm. raising living standards for families. That in the end means more productivity and the reason our productivity is lower than Germany, France or America is not because Brits don't work as hard, it's mm. because we invest less as a proportion of our GDP and that's what I hope we will change as a result of the autumn statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Siobhan. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Chancellor, how stupid do you think the British people are? You raise taxes by the equivalent of 10p in national insurance and then cut national insurance by 2p. You refuse to raise the tax thresholds for six years. You and I both know that, uh, that people will be paying £1,200 more in tax as a result of your measures. Aren't people right that you've been gouging with one hand and giving crumbs back with the other? Um, that is absolutely not what has been happening. Um, and um, I think it was absolutely right that we helped businesses through the pandemic, uh, protecting nine million jobs, meaning that we have one of the fastest recoveries from the pandemic of any large European country. And I think it was absolutely right, about £400 billion of support there and about £100 billion of support 
in the cost of living crisis caused principally by the invasion of Ukraine. And I don't remember anyone on your side of Parliament or on mine saying that was the wrong thing to do or indeed that was gouging. What they said actually we were right to step in and help families. But we're also honest with people that if you want to give that kind of level of support then you have to pay for it. Now what is different about the autumn statement is that having gone through a period where taxes had to go up in order to give that support, uh, we're now in a position where with inflation halved, uh, with nearly every economic forecast increasing our growth rate, uh, we are able to start to reduce yeah. the tax can, burden. Can I ask how much tax do you think it's reasonable for a police sergeant, a senior nurse or a deputy head teacher to pay? Well, as a result of the um, cuts to national insurance, an average teacher will uh, get about £630 more next year, an average a nurse will be about £520, a police officer about £630 reduction. Um, that is a step towards relieving the pressure, but I wouldn't say for a moment that they haven't seen, yeah, as everyone has seen, just let me finish, they haven't seen that's their that's taxes that's go no, no, up. No, I'm, I'm sorry, we get to be members of this committee and ask you questions rather than you tell us how long you're going to speak to us at. Um, after the government tax measures, 182,765 nurses, 141,827 teachers and 60,680 police officers will fall into the 40% tax bracket. Is that who the upper tax bracket was intended for? Well, one of the ways that we raised money, and by the way, all I was trying to do was answer your first question. Um, so if you were kind enough to let me answer the questions, I will do my very best to do so. Now, you asked me about the freezing of tax thresholds, which I'm happy to talk about. It is true that one of the ways that we were able to fund that extra support for families during the pandemic and the cost of living crisis was by freezing tax thresholds. Um, we um, then had a position in this autumn statement where it was possible to relieve tax pressure. And I took the choice to concentrate those efforts in areas that would grow the economy the most. And that was why Paul Johnson said yesterday uh, that if you're going to reduce taxes, these were the right taxes to reduce. Um, the national insurance cut that we were talking about means that you get about 100,000 more people full-time equivalent into the workforce. That helps growth. Uh, the uh, business expensing uh, increase in tax relief, full expensing, uh, means that we will increase investment in the but economy teachers, over the next five years. Well, let me finish by 14. You intended to well, go how, do we the, pay, the tax rate? how do we pay for schools? How do we pay for hospitals? We pay for it through the wealth generated by the economy. Now, what the OBR said is that the full expensing measure will increase investment by about £14 billion over the next five years, which means more growth, more tax revenues, more money for schools and hospitals. Um, Chancellor, could you remind me who was it that said, if you put your hands into people's pockets and take money out of them and they do not see visible improvements in the services they receive, they get very angry indeed. Our public services are crumbling, our rivers are full of sewage, 8 million people on NHS waiting lists, the highest since records began, and taxes are at their highest since World War II. Um, do you think that the voters may be very, very angry by the time we get to the next election? Well, I think the voters are very realistic that Who's we have had. Would, that, would by you the like way? to. Sorry. I'm very. Well, I hope you'll tell me. You. Right. Um, well, um, then it's a very wise comment. And I think voters are very realistic about the fact that we have been through um, a global shock with the pandemic and a global shock with the energy crisis. And they want to see improvements in public services. And that's why they welcome the fact that, for example, since 2010, crime has halved. Uh, excluding uh, computer crime and fraud, which weren't measured in 2010, but violent crime, burglaries have halved, that school standards have risen to their highest ever, that we have more doctors and nurses in the NHS, although it's still uh, struggling to recover post-pandemic. But absolutely, I want to see standards in public services 
going up. And when it comes to river pollution, that's why I'm very pleased this government has uh, required the water companies to invest over £50 billion over the years ahead to clean up our rivers. Um, uh, I don't want to end on a bad note. So I, wanted to I know you wouldn't. Uh, so I want to congratulate you on a historic first. The first parliament ever since records began where household disposable incomes actually fall. Living standards will fall by 3.1% between December 2019 and January 2025. Households on average will be £1,900 poorer at the end of this parliament than at its start. Do you think that's a proud record? Well, what um, everyone knows is that there are reasons why not just the UK, but the whole world is seeing that pressure on living standards because of the exceptional events that we had uh, with the pandemic and the energy crisis. But I would just point you to the fact that a year ago, the OBR said that living standards were going to fall by 3.7%, and they've actually gone up by 2.5%. So under good conservative economic management, things turn out better. I don't think that's how people are feeling. Thank you, Siobhan. Amory. Thank you, Chair. Chancellor, departmental spending. Now, we haven't obviously got the spending review, but the conclusion uh, from the commentators and others is that departmental, departmental spending will ultimately fall by 19 billion. Is that accurate? Um, well, in real terms, departmental spending will be £85 billion higher in real terms um, at the end of the five-year period we're looking at compared to the start of this parliament. Um, and that is 3.2% uh, real terms increase every year this parliament. And then in the following uh, spending review, a 1% real terms increase. So can you explain to me why is it that the figures which are being put out in the media talk about this 19 billion cut. What are they talking about? What are the assumptions that are being made, which is what enables them, they believe, to put that figure out there? Um, because we have made a decision that public spending should go at, grow at a lower rate than the growth in the economy. Because of the um, increase in the tax burden that's happened as a result of our support uh, for the families that's obviously troubling Ms McDonough so, so much. Um, we've decided that it is now time to grow public spending at a slower rate than the growth in the economy. So if you look at the difference between those two, you could say that was a £19 billion difference. Um, but we are confident that if we improve the productivity of our public spending, uh, which we think is entirely possible to do, we can make sure that uh, that happens in a way that does not affect the services that matter to people. That's good to know, Chancellor. But productivity is a real challenge, getting productivity, efficiency. It has been uh, nirvana for many, many of your predecessors. What is it you are going to say to each of the government departments as to the principles that you want them to apply to drive that productivity because clearly there are going to be some things that they deliver which are more crucial certainly for frontline delivery of services than others. So what is the guideline, what is the metric and how are you going to manage it, which is a challenge, to make sure that that uh, change uh, is made in the right way without losing, which is clearly your ambition the delivery of uh, front-end uh, services? We're going to say, we are saying to all government departments four things. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to protect the services the public uh, enjoy and value. Um, secondly, we want departments uh, to look at how they can improve productivity by looking at time wasted on unnecessary admin. So initial work with the Home Office suggests that police officers waste 38 million hours every year. That's the equivalent of the time of 20,000 police officers filling out forms, uh, redacting forms, um, uh, processes that could be avoided. 
um, an average of about eight hours per police officer per week. Uh, we think the numbers are probably very similar for doctors, nurses. We know that teachers spend more time not teaching than teaching. Um, so we want to look at what we can do to reduce uh, the uh, unnecessary admin that our public servants face, which by the way they find as frustrating as, as we do. Uh, we also want to look at what can be done in the way of prevention. How could we spend money in the short term in a way that reduces uh, the pressure on public services two, three, four years later and um, there are many initiatives in the NHS at the moment on how we could um, uh, take a smarter approach to prevention. And then finally we want to see how we can use new technologies like, like AI where the UK is a global leader. And is your expectation that that could be done without any statutory instruments, legislative change? Is it something that can be done simply by looking at <coughs> work practices or is there going to be a bit of a battle, whether it's cultural or whether it's changing a department's rule book, that means Parliament is going to have to intervene to fix it? Um, th there may be times when um, there are changes in legislation that are necessary, but most of the time it will be because we take a smarter approach to public spending and that includes by the way the Treasury taking a smarter approach to public spending I mean you know too often when departments have come under pressure uh, the Treasury has said you know uh, well you have to uh, consume your own smoke and then you'd find an IT project is cancelled or delay delayed when it's that IT project that could have improved productivity over the medium term. So um, we are all going to have to think differently uh, in order to deliver those improvements in productivity. And how are you going to monitor that need to think differently and act differently because trying to change things, uh, getting mental acceptance as well as the, the physical effect is very hard unless somebody is absolutely monitoring, watching, asking for regular reports, it won't happen. You're absolutely right. Uh, what gets measured gets done. Um, so we have started this process when John Glenn was Chief Secretary of the Treasury. He started this process in October. Laura Trott is now carrying it on and our intention is to complete this over uh, the next 12 months in very good time for negotiating the next spending review which will come into place from April 2025. So. Let's turn to the big spenders, uh, the NHS, which you, you and I absolutely have a, have a, have a great uh, empathy and both see health as absolutely crucial uh, to, to get right uh, in this country and, and, and for our residents. But it is the biggest spending department and, and therefore for them it is going to be one of the hardest things to do. Um, the, the previous Secretary of State did try very hard to cut out unnecessary roles, unnecessary procedures. Um, but I think he found it quite challenging. So given that is one, one of the most important to a higher spending, what particular focus are you going to give? What can you do to really fundamentally change how we do this so we get better health outcomes but we don't get bedeviled by all the bureaucracy and wasted money spent on roles we don't need? Well, um, I think there is a, a huge opportunity and I've had um, significant discussions with both the Chair and the Chief Executive of the NHS about how to make those productivity changes happen. But I think you only need to talk to a nurse on the front line about the time they spend filling out forms as opposed to looking after patients. And you can see the opportunity is absolutely huge. Um, it's um, beginning to improve with um, new IT systems being put into hospitals um, but there's a long way to go and um, you know the IFS point out that we have 25% more doctors and 20% more nurses than pre-pandemic uh, and the number of people admitted to hospital for treatment both emergency and non-emergency is actually at the same level as pre-pandemic and so we're still getting over the the difficulties and the challenges caused by the pandemic, but we are absolutely determined to do that. And Chancellor, given the circumstances we find ourselves in, are there any budget areas where you feel economically, politically, given the current crisis, I'm thinking perhaps defence, are there any which might be ring-fenced because for UKPLC, 
they are just too important. I'm not suggesting they get let off a hook in terms of efficiencies, but if you like, the principle is adopted that this is, is so important for the nation that we will ring fence uh, and make sure what we've promised will get done. Well, on defence, we already have a commitment to spend 2% of GDP, which is a NATO commitment, and because we will meet that commitment, defence spending will go up as, as GDP goes up. And in fact, we said we want to increase it to 2.5% of GDP when it's affordable to do so. So we are um, absolutely recognise the pressures. We recognise the pressures in health because of an ageing population and the long-term increase in demand and indeed on the social care system. But I would say that you could find a very good reason for uh, needing to sustain and improve the level of service received by the public in every area of public service. They're all important in different ways, but in every single one we need to be asking challenging questions about how to deliver more for less um, and get better value for money for the taxpayer, particularly after a period of um, huge increases in investment in public services that we've seen over recent years caused by things like the pandemic. Um, I think now what taxpayers want to see is uh, real improvements in productivity so that they can be confident that every pound they are, that's being spent on their behalf is being spent wisely. You will have one more, one more question, if I may. Um, there might be time at the end. All right. Yeah. Uh, Drew. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, you talked earlier about how you hope growth will pay for schools and other infrastructure in the future, leaving aside the fact that the analysis pretty much shows that growth is going to be stagnant or very, very low in indeed. Um, we're still being hit by very high interest rates, and yet you've decided to hold capital departmental spending flat in cash terms for an additional year, uh, which the OBR says that means a public sector fixed capital for, uh, formation falls as a share of GDP, now falls from 3.6% this year to 3.1% in 2029. That's a significant real terms cut. So do you agree that your investment plans risk future growth? No, um, and I think it's, if I may say, Mr Henry, it's, it's not a fair characterisation of what the OBR said. So they said that the measures that I announced I've just in... just quoted it. Uh, well, let me just explain the context. They said the measures that I announced in the spring budget and uh, the autumn statement uh, amount to a permanent increase in GDP of half a percent. Um, and uh, the primary focus of the autumn statement, those 110 measures that the chair talked about, are to increase business investment, private sector investment, by £20 billion a year. Um, public sector investment is a very important part of that, but my priority, by getting a £20 billion a year annual increase in investment, that is the long-term way. That, a lot of that will feed through after the five-year period. Um, it's still the right thing to do. Um, increasing the incentives for businesses to invest make a massive difference in the long run to the um, ability of the economy to generate wealth to pay for our public services. But even if you're right in that five-year period, public sector uh, investment is going to go down. It's a real terms cut. You haven't argued with that fact. By holding capital investment flat in cash terms, aren't you merely just storing up the need for even greater public investment in the future? Well, let me put that particular comment in context, because you're absolutely right. We had to take very difficult decisions um, over uh, revenue spending and capital spending in the autumn statement. But in terms of capital spending, uh, in uh, the spending review of 2020, uh, the Prime Minister, who was Chancellor at the time, uh, announced the biggest ever increase in capital spending, 20% increase in capital spending. And so capital spending next year will be £30 billion higher in real terms than it was in 2019. So what you've had is a very big increase in capital spending in real terms, which I have said, I said in the autumn statement last year, I would protect in cash terms. I haven't been able to protect it in real terms, but I'm protecting it in cash terms. So uh, the comments you're making are in the context of what has already been uh, one of our biggest ever increases. No context is that it's reducing. Uh, let's look at the public sector estate that was recently hit by concerns of a reinforced or autoclaved rated concrete or rack as it's called. 
Um, have you looked at where funds will be needed in an ageing estate uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to, be, to improve the public sector estate for major works? Absolutely, that's why, um, and, and, but the context is an increase okay. in okay. public sector. Hang on, no, you, just, I, you asked me about the context. Finish your it's an increase, um, and because of that increase, we are able to allocate resources to rack hospitals, rack schools, and of course our absolute priority is the safety of the public. Okay, what funding is required then? Well, um, you said you'd looked at it, you just gave me yes. your um, examples. Uh, so, um, when the Department of for Education writes to us and says we need this funding to deal with unsafe rat so schools. So you're saying there isn't an estimate of the amount at the moment? I'm very happy to write to you with what the Department the, for Education but, but and the Department for Health have written to me about and asked. I don't have the numbers in front of me now. So you no. don't have the numbers, so you Not don't know what money now. will be required in uh, order to... By definition, you won't know what money is going to be required to do that work. Well, we, what we know is that uh, we have... Uh, done a much more thorough survey of rack schools than, for example, has happened in Scotland. Um, so we have a much better picture of where the issues are, and we are funding schools that need to make the necessary repairs. And you don't know what that amount is, though. I don't have it in front of me. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm very happy to write to you with the details. But you would have thought, with such a big decision and such a major issue, that you would have those details in front of you just now, Chancellor. Let me I'm uh, switch. Very to sorry, I don't have them right in front of me now, but I will let you have them. Well, you might at least have taken them into uh, context. But let's um, let's ask about uh, climate change. Do you think climate change is going to require significant uh, strengthening of public infrastructure? And if so, where does the com current funding meet that? Um, well, I think it is going to need a big transformation in our infrastructure. Um, and that is exactly what we've seen. So um, when um, Conservatives came to office in 2010, about 2% of our electricity came from renewable sources from memory. I think now it's about 40%. Uh, we have the biggest, uh, the biggest, the second biggest and the third biggest offshore wind farms in the world. Uh, there has been huge public investment in renewable energy, and we need that to continue. And so, where where is it? Go, where's the funding going to go in terms of that infrastructure? Well, um, it's going to go into uh, CCUS hydrogen offshore wind farms. On Friday last week, we announced mm -hmm. uh, an extra fund of 960 million pounds to catalyse investment. But we also have the contracts for difference. Uh, program which those, is those also are, attracting investment. Those are very, very big areas that you're talking about. How does that split? How does that split between the areas that you've just identified? Well, um, we've allocated just under a billion pounds um, and the... So for uh, example, how much of that is to CCUS? Yes. I was about to answer your question. Okay. Um, uh, for um, The um, Energy Secretary will uh, in due course announce what proportion of that will be going to different areas, but for CCUS in particular as I think you know, there is a £20 billion commitment uh, over the uh, years ahead to invest in CCUS, and we are very confident that we are on track. And how much is going to nuclear? Um, well, on nuclear, uh, I think in my first fiscal event, which was the autumn statement last year, um, I announced £900 million uh, for Sizewell C, and we want 25% of our energy to come from nuclear by 2050. So we continue, at the moment, the principal piece of work that's been happening this year, apart from progressing the size well investment, has been um, the competition for SMRs, uh, which we'll hope, we're hoping will have concluded shortly, so that we can start to invest in SMRs as well as the larger nuclear power stations. Okay, and finally, how much is going to offshore wind, tidal and storage? Well, a, a large proportion has gone and a large proportion will go um, and we continue to have auctions but we are the second largest generator of offshore wind energy in so the world you, after China. Do, how much are you investing in future though? What's the split? Um, I will tell you, well, uh, the split of going forward? Well, it's a, combi the it's a combination, yes, uh, well it's a proportion of the uh, 960 million pounds um, and we will be proceeding early next year with the next auctions for offshore wind. And as I say, we've been more attractive in getting offshore wind investment off the ground in this country than anywhere in Europe, indeed anywhere in the world, apart from China. Apart from the fact it's a relatively small amount. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Drew.
Let me start by saying how encouraged and uh, impressed I was by what you managed to achieve with the autumn statement, given where we were and the forecasts earlier in the year. It was very, very encouraging, particularly on the uh, on the tax cut, and you know, encouraged by what we're seeing on inflation on, on the debt forecast. So, um, so, 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 congratulations. Can I ask you about another, a couple of other indicators, though, that are quite concerning? Unemployment is now rising. Vacancies are falling in the. Uh, uh, in the economy, so the so the you know what was a very tight labour market is now looking less so. Bankruptcies are up. There are people saying that we are already in recession, and certainly predicting that we might be. What's your level of confidence that we're not looking at a recession in the coming months? Well, the OBR's judgment is that we won't have a recession next year. Um, of course, we want to do everything we can to avoid going into a recession. Um, but you're absolutely right to say that growth is currently subdued and indeed unemployment has started to go up slightly um, and that is because uh, the Bank of England has rightly put interest rates up in order to remove high inflation from the system and that is a very difficult choice but it's the right choice um, because we know in the end that sustainable growth over the long run is not possible if you have high inflation and so uh, this year and next as we bring inflation down to target we will see lower growth because of that um, but when we brought inflation down to target the IMF say that growth here will be faster than France, Germany or Italy so I think the long-term prognosis is much more encouraging. Thank you. You mentioned earlier GDP per head which is encouraging and it's I think really important that we always remember that that is the that's the, the indicator that matters most, and, and our chronic uh, long-term productivity challenges. And I agree with you that the an underlying cause of that is low investment over, over many years, and I I'm very much support what the government's doing to address that. But another factor that drives our GDP per head and our productivity down is our high rates of immigration. Do you agree with that, and do you think that having well over... Uh, to well over 600,000 last year, 700,000 net migrants into the country, many of them on low wages, depresses productivity and uh, growth per head. I, I agree with you that immigration is too high and I also think that it is uh, wrong for businesses to uh, be filling their vacancies with people from overseas when we've got people here at home who are not working who would be better off if they were working mm -hmm. and so I think there's a big transition we need to make um, so that we are increasing the employment rate in mm -hmm. the economy of people who are here um, and uh, reducing the, the six million adults of working age who are not in work mm -hmm. and there are lots of things that we need to do to make that happen um, but they are all linked to the uh, ability to bring down migration to sustainable levels without damaging the economy. One of them is the childcare measures that I announced in the budget, which will make it easier for um, parents to go back to work. Then the, the measures that we announced for long-term sick and disabled, um, which is uh, uh, going to, it's about two and a half billion pounds we're going to spend over the next five years to break down the barriers for them and the third group which is the long-term unemployed people who don't have a sickness or disability. We still have 300,000 people who've been out of work for more than a year uh, despite not having any illness or disability and there being nearly a million vacancies in the economy. So uh, that is what we need to yeah. address. Yeah. Well I, I'm very much support efforts to invest in people and to improve skills as well and that's definitely part of our the, cracking the productivity challenge. The other part is, is technologies. So let me move on to the plans for, for expensing, which again I welcome. Uh, we need to get more private sector investment and rewarding uh, investment in, in machinery is, is very, very welcome. Do you think that companies are going to really feel the, uh, the, the value of the uh, full expensing when they're also facing a significant increase in corporation tax? Do you, do you expect their experience to be one of of relief, even if you, even if it might direct investment in the right direction, do you think companies are going to thank you for it? Um, I think uh, you know companies were 
uh, unusually very positive about the Chancellor's announcement after the autumn statement. Um, you know, the CBI said that uh, full expensing was a game changer that would fire up the economy. Um, and they recognised that, they said before the autumn statement, it was the single most transformative thing I could do. Because I think there's widespread agreement that you know, we have the most innovative economy in Europe. We have a tech sector that's double the size of Germany, three times the size of France. We're the life science centre of Europe, uh, film and TV centre of Europe. We have incredible strengths in the innovation industries of the future, but we still have productivity that is lower than uh, Germany, America and France. So if we could sort out that productivity, mm. uh, we would be unstoppable. Mm. And that is very closely linked to business investment. It's about 2% of GDP lower here than in countries like France, Germany and America. So um, corporation tax uh, headline rate is still the lowest in the G7. Uh, uh, but I think this... Not as low as it should have been if you become leader. Well, um, I've changed my views on that. I used to think that what mattered more than anything was the headline rate of mm. corporation tax, which, as I say, is still lower than our large economy competitors. Mm. But I think what we've done is reduce the effective rate of corporation tax with an investment relief, um, which will be more effective at encouraging investment than uh, a reduction in the headline rate would have been. Okay, but it's only for certain parts of certain, certain companies, isn't it? Certain, uh, certain forms of investment. Can you just explain to me the decision not to apply it to all forms of investment? And, and indeed, related to that, uh, the, 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 I think it's a million pounds allowance is, is, is being, being brought forward. That will predominantly benefit larger businesses. Do you think you could have done more to stimulate investment and support startups, which, as you say, is the future of our economy in the tech sectors? We need to support all types of business. Yeah. So for startups, we announced that we're extending the EIS and SEIS and VCT schemes for uh, another 10 years from 2025. Um, that has probably been the single biggest measure that has made us the startup capital of Europe when it comes to high growth, high tech businesses. Um, and so we, we want to do lots of things. The, the mansion house reforms on pension funds also mm -hmm designed to make a big difference when it comes to their ability to raise capital. But we are very specifically wanting to make sure that uh, larger businesses that make uh, decisions which can have a huge impact on investment levels in the economy are incentivized to do that in the UK. And we now have a more attractive business investment regime than uh, any of the large countries who out-invest us. And that is the way that we think we will catch up. Okay. Oh, um, sorry. I think my colleague. Uh, if I may, just yeah. add one thing, yeah. Mr. Kruger, to and, and chair to the to the Chancellor's um, comment. As 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 the Chancellor explains, it's targeted at those largest, most capital intensive yeah. firms. The permanent full expensing measure, but it also builds on the decision of the Chancellor, you asked about small business, mm -hmm. the Chancellor took last autumn to set the annual investment allowance at £1 million, which means that 99% of all businesses, those smaller businesses, already receive up to that £1 million the same benefits as full expensing, 100% yes, yes. um, tax relief on their qualifying plant and machinery investment. Okay. And, and just thank you, that's very helpful. And, and to either of you, I mean, one of the problems we've got in our economy is there's, there's major emphasis on debt finance. You know, can, Compared particularly with the US, we don't seem to generate enough equity finance, particularly for, for, for startup businesses. Is there anything in, this, in the package that encourages more equity? <coughs> um, well, certainly the extension of the EIS and SAI schemes for startups uh, will make a very big difference. And I think that's one of the most generous schemes of its kind mm. in the world. But more broadly, I completely agree with you. I think the uh, the mansion house reforms are designed to increase the amount of capital going into unlisted private growth companies um, in the way that successfully happens yes. for Australian and Canadian pension funds. Um, and I think if we can do that, we can dramatically increase the flow of capital, which will increase the, uh, the, the use of equity finance. Okay, very good. Have I got time for one last question, Chair? Very quick question, quick, quick, quick answer. Are you content with the, the, just totally jumping onto another topic, content with the rate of, of QT and the, and the bank's decision to unwind in the way it is? Bearing in mind they're selling these bonds at a great loss and, the, and, the, and that loss is being borne by the 
Treasury and by the taxpayer, and ultimately you have to sign off these these sales. It's not is they're not an independent bank in the, in respect to QT. So are you content with what they're doing? Given, given that? well, I, I I do have to indemnify the bank in order to make it possible, mm. but it is a tool that is exercised independently as part of their uh, array of tools on monetary policy, um, and so it isn't appropriate for me to comment on just as I wouldn't comment mm. on. Uh, whether it's right or wrong to raise or lower interest rates, I, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment but on that. But you do have to approve it. I, I have to indemnify the bank to make it possible, but having done that, it is then their decision as to the extent to which they well, do th QE or QT. Yeah. Yeah. I think in every... OK, I'll leave it there. Thanks, John. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, and just on the... Uh, question about full expensing, uh, William, is there information the Treasury is seeing that's not yet in the public domain that shows that full expensing is working so effectively that it's worth making permanent? Um, Chair, if uh, the Chancellor's talked about the kind of combined effect of his growth measures and their long run mm. impact on business investment at the 10 year horizon, what the OBR have actually done specifically on full expensing um, is um, assess that its impact on business investment is broadly three. No, no, billion. I meant in 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 the time it's been in place. So full expensing has been in place this fiscal year. Have you started to see that that's had a really positive impact, and that's something that will be disclosed? Sure, maybe, I'm, maybe I can help yeah, you on that you, one um, because I think yeah. the um, there is some evidence actually um, because the precur I introduced it on a temporary basis at the start mm. of this year. But the precursor was the uh, then Chancellor, now mm, Prime Minister, which is doing the super yeah. deduction in 2019. Since then, we have had the fastest growth in investment of any G7 economy since that was since the super deduction was. But the announced. super deduction was 130 pence. Yes, wasn't but it? it's a kind of precursor. Uh, it's, it was the first time we put in place an investment incentive, and then before that finished, I introduced temporary full expensing, and now I've introduced permanent mm. full expensing. So I think you can see. Um, since we've started down this journey of introducing investment incentives, uh, that we have actually had investment growth that has outpaced other large economies. Okay, thank you. Kia. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Mr. McFarlane, for, for coming. Um, I'd like to turn to work capability assessments and welfare reforms more generally. Um, so, for businesses in my constituency, but also across the country, suffering with enormous labour shortages, the number of vacancies standing around 960,000 in October of this year. But the OBR expects, expects that the labour market impact of changes to work capability assessments will actually be quite small and will raise employment by only 10,000 by 2028-29. So I wonder when the Resolution Foundation has identified that these changes will hit the welfare of the poorest hardest, and when a lot of disability rights charities have raised concerns about these reforms too, why are you persisting with a policy that in many senses will have quite a piecemeal impact on those labour market challenges that we're facing? Well, the uh, long-term effect of these changes will be significantly higher than that, but it's precisely because uh, this is a very vulnerable group of people that we are introducing these changes very gradually over a five-year period. But the result of these changes will be that the number of people who uh, get the form of benefit where there is no support to help them to work and no requirement for them to look for work will be more than halved. And those people will be helped with a, a programme that we're, we're spending about two and a half billion pounds over the next five years um, to reflect the fact that many of them would like to work uh, many of them have uh, mental health issues where there is a lot of evidence that working is better for your mental health. And many of them with mobility issues uh, will be able to do work from home in a way that wouldn't have been possible before. So reflecting all those changes, um, I think the, the overall impact of uh, the welfare reforms that we've announced, the OBR says is 50,000 in total, um, of which the uh, WCA is a proportion, but we think the long-term impact will be uh, very significant. See, I question perhaps some of those underlying assumptions about when we know from the existing labour pool that people with disabilities are not more likely to be home workers than the general labour force, but in any case, I, I'd be interested to ask you about 
the challenges that are quite well documented that we know a lot of people with disabilities face with the DWP, whether that's being judged as being fit to work when they're not and being sanctioned as a result. And I do have concerns that if these failings repeat themselves under the new changes to work capability assessments, we might end up in a situation where people with disabilities may have their benefits stopped altogether. And I just wondered if you could kind of put yourself in the shoes of somebody who might fall into that unfortunate predicament. What, what would you do if that ended up happening when you'd already faced a stone wall from the DWP on many other occasions? Well, I um, would hope that we have a system that is compassionate to people with disabilities but also fair to taxpayers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my starting point, if I can explain it this way uh, to you, Mr. Mather, is that at the moment, uh, around 100,000 people every year are being classified as uh, too ill or sufficiently disabled uh, that they should not even, they shouldn't be helped to find work and they shouldn't be required to look for work. 100,000 people a year. I think that is a, a shocking waste of potential and I don't believe it is uh, good for the individuals involved, many of whom would like to work and so I think we have to find a better way and these measures are designed to give people support to help them get back into the world of work. Um, you know, About f half a million people are going to get additional mental health support including 100,000 people with the severest mental health issues. Uh, we're going to do extend the universal support program to 200,000 people. Um, we are spending hard cash to do this because we think that it is better for them um, and also better for society and better for the economy. So is it your view that the existing reforms to work capability assessments as they stand build sufficient safeguards into the system that will ensure that people who aren't able to work aren't wrongly classified as such? and then have their benefits stopped when we do have evidence of that currently occurring under the existing regime? That is my judgment, but I also know that Mel Stride, the DWP Secretary, is monitoring these things very closely and he wants to make sure absolutely that we give the right kind of support to people uh, when they need it. Okay, and um, can I turn next to business rates please? Um, Paul Johnson described the rollover of business rates relief as no way to make policy and the IFS's official response to the autumn statement argued that the uncertainty about whether reliefs really are temporary or are likely to be permanent makes it difficult for businesses to be plan, uh, to plan for the future. Do you feel that this kind of culture of unstable rollover, does it necessitate the case for a more comprehensive reform of business rates overall in your view? Um, we have introduced a very big reform of business rates uh, a year ago at the autumn statement which was a big request from business we are transitioning uh, to a new system of business rates to new valuations um, and uh, we gave businesses a 12 and a half billion pound cut to business rates which is an average of about 10 percent for every business in the country in order to make sure that uh, the transition was effective um, I, I agree with Paul Johnson in in principle um, but I think there are times where you have to make an exception and one of those times was the pandemic where um, particularly uh, retail, hospitality and leisure were very badly affected um, and business rates was one of the immediate ways that we could stop many of those businesses going bust and I think coming out of that is a process that you go on and I think it was right in the autumn statement to roll it on for one more year. And not to have a, a kind of a over a longer time scale because I, I agree that the circumstances are exceptional but they they don't remain exceptional in the same way but if this is going to become a new reality of small businesses needing that sort of support is it not better to have a comprehensive and longer lasting interpretation of how long to extend the relief for I, I think we've shown in the autumn statement uh, that we understand that the need to uh, move away from temporary relief so you know, we're not extending the uh, energy price guarantee at its low level uh, beyond April, but we are introducing other support for families with cost of living pressures, for example, by increasing benefits by double the rate of next year's predicted inflation or increasing pensions by triple the rate of next year's uh, predicted inflation. And those are permanent increases to people's income. And I think that in the long run, you do need to transition out of temporary support 
but you need to make a judgment as to the rate at which you do that. Okay, and just on the, do I, do I have much time left? Oh, wonderful. Um, I was wondering on the question of high streets as well. I mean, I've seen from the closure of the branch of Wilco in my own constituency that kind of, irrespective of the rhetoric we've seen from successive Conservative governments over the levelling up agenda, it seems that high streets in kind of northern towns like mine and Selby seem to be particularly hard hit by the economic headwinds that we're facing. I wonder whether these reforms or extensions to business rates for relief, in your view, offer enough to those kind of brick and mortar businesses as opposed to the kind of online retailers which increasingly take greater kind of shares of the market in which they operate? Well, I think we want to help all businesses. So um, we spoke to the Federation of Small Businesses and they said that the number one thing that we could do to help all small businesses was to uh, take measures to end the scourge of late payments. So we've said that anyone getting contracts from the government uh, must pay their suppliers, their subcontractors uh, promptly as the government pays them promptly. Uh, I think the second thing on their list was rolling over the temporary relief for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses to protect the high street. So we took our cue from them as, as people who are, I think, you know, the voice of small business. And um, just as a final question, and to build on the point that Anne-Marie made earlier around defence spending, the Defence Secretary has consistently reminded us that we must kind of keep Ukraine and the situation there at the absolute forefront of their minds, and I agree. But in this context, why was there no kind of 2024 military funding or action plan for Ukraine contained within the autumn statement? Well, we made very big commitments to Ukraine, um, uh, 2.3 billion last year, 2.3 billion this year in direct support, then, you know, support for the Ukrainian economy uh, through uh, World Bank loans. And so we continue to uh, keep under review our support for Ukraine. But the Defence Secretary is absolutely right. Uh, this is an existential battle for democracy and human rights, and we must continue to stand four square behind the people of Ukraine. By the way, the Ukrainian finance minister said to me in Marrakesh, when I met him uh, earlier in the autumn, that there was no country giving more support to Ukraine than the UK. And in but in terms of certainty, would it have not been wise to have used the autumn statement as a moment to signal the level of support that the UK continues to demonstrate, in your view? I think we have signalled that, and I think the Ukrainians would say that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Keir. Angela. Thank you very much. I'm a bit concerned about the gap between rhetoric and reality in your autumn statement. Chancellor, you said taxes were down, but they're up, aren't they? I did indeed cut taxes by, I think yesterday Torsten Bell said that it was um, the biggest tax cut since 1988. But overall, um, taxes are But it's are in up, a context, yes, it's, it's in a context where taxes have been going up, but I wanted to make the point that having gone up for some years because of the pandemic and, and uh, the energy crisis, well, I think it was right to support families and businesses, uh, we were now in a starting in a position to start to bring them down, and that's what I did. Um, since you've quoted Torsten Bell, he also, uh, the, the Resolution Foundation summary of the budget at uh, your um, autumn statement, which is sort of a budget really, um, described you as getting your pre-election giveaways in early. Um, with an autumn statement offering tax cuts today at the price of implausible spending cuts tomorrow. That seems a reasonable summary to me. Well, I agree with many things that Torsten Bell says, but not that. Oh, right. Um, so you, you were quoting so him let me, a second let me, ago. Um, let me explain <laughs> why. But you don't agree with, with that. Yes, that I don't agree bit. with that. No, I don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason is because um, uh, the tax cuts that uh, I announced are tax cuts designed to help growth and the way that we fund our public services uh, over the medium term is by having a healthily growing economy. I negotiated when I was health secretary uh, a 20 billion pound increase in the NHS budget, nearly 1% of GDP, um, after we had successfully turned around the economy post 2010 and got it healthily growing again. And but the, but what the we said, hang on, let me finish, I may finish, the, when the CBI say this is something that is a game changer that will fire up the British economy. I think you can say that things like full expensing or indeed um, a cut in national insurance which adds 100,000 people or thereabouts to our national labour force there uh, as an FT equivalent, those are things that help growth and they are good for public services. Well, um, it was described as fiscal fiction what you want to do uh, with 
public spending because basically you've taken all of the extra tax receipts uh, and, and benefit you've got from inflation persisting longer and higher than was originally thought, but you haven't compensated uh, public spending, local authorities or anybody for the extra costs of that inflation, have you? Well, um, first of all, public spending is still going up in real terms. Um, secondly, it would be fiscal fiction if uh, the way I used uh, the, those resources was in tax cuts that had no impact on growth, but I didn't. I chose to cut taxes in areas where, we, for example, the most uh, expensive tax cut I announced was to capital allowances, which is a tax cut that I'm sure the majority of voters in your constituency, my constituency, have never heard of, um, but is something that makes a massive difference to the long-term growth in the economy. Well, and I think that's why I, that's why I chose want, it. We want it to make a, a, a massive difference um, to long-term growth rates because actually the OBR forecast downgraded future growth uh, for the next three years uh, quite substantially. So. Why cut public sector investment if you want growth? Um, well, because in real terms, you and, and you mentioned this earlier, you have cut it substantially. Well, let's just, I mean, first of all, the OBR forecast was out of line with most other independent forecasters. And as uh, David Smith said in the Sunday Times, the uh, reduction in that growth rate to 1.6% was nothing to do with my measures. My measures, they said, uh, increased permanently GDP by, if you combine it with the spring budget, by 0.5%. And if we want money for public services, I mean, the OECD today said that um, the increase in business investment and the increase in labour supply to the economy has the potential to improve the fiscal position, improve our ability to fund public services, because it increases growth, and that's what I was trying to do. Well, at time will... Time will tell, but I would have thought that given um, the, uh, it, the, the desire and the absolute requirement to reach net zero and to transform a lot of our infrastructure, which I'll come on to soon, we need a proper um, partnership between public sector, capital investment and private sector. And yet you've signalled to the private sector, just as you want them to invest more um, after the chaos of the last few years, uh, that you're not going to put your money where your mouth is in terms of public sector investment? Well, that's not what the private sector has said. The private sector has said um, that uh, the business investment reliefs, which are now the most generous of any large economy anywhere, are a game changer and will really encourage investment going forward. And I think clean energy is a sector where it's very visible to see that we've already made a lot of progress over the last decade, um, but we need more to happen because we have to double the amount of electricity we generate by 2050, and these measures will make it easier to attract private investment, um, and that was the very strong message we had from investors from all over the world who came to the Global Investment Summit on Monday. This is the worst parliament on record for growth in household disposable income, isn't it? 3.5% fall between the last election in 2019 and the coming one whenever that is next year. I don't know whether you want to announce when that might be today, but we know it's sometime next year. Um, this is the Parliament where we had a once-in-a-century pandemic and a 1970s-style oil shock. So what the government will be judged on is do we put in place the policies that allow us to grow out of those absolute catastrophes for households in this country and also around the world. And um, every single major forecaster has upgraded their forecasts for the UK economy this year compared to where we were a year ago. But the Bank what of I would England say is the long-term prospects. There's a 50-50 chance of a recession next year. The Bank uh, of England's uh, forecast. That's what they're saying now. What they said a year ago is we were going to have the longest recession in 100 years. Mm -hmm. So there is a big improvement in the outlook for the UK economy. A year ago, the OBR believed that the economy would contract by 1.4 percent. Now they think this year it's going to grow by 0.6 percent. That's a 2 percent difference. So there's been a big improvement in the outlook for the British economy. 
But what I would say to you, Dame Angela, is that I want our long-term growth rate to be higher than the 1.6% that the OBR uh, are talking about within the five years. And that's why I announced those 110 measures to increase business investment by about £20 billion a year. And when those feed through, I believe it will be significantly higher. OK, well, let's look at your, um, your uh, measures on infrastructure investment. Uh, Sir John Armit, um, your own infrastructure advisor, told the Financial Times last week that private industry won't fund the tunnels HS2 needs to get the final 4.5 miles to Euston and dismissed the idea that public-private partnership behind the Battersea redevelopment is a comparable model uh, to apply with no provision in your statement for the London leg of HS2, what's going to happen? Well, I have very encouraging conversations with um, organisations like Lendlease about the Euston development. Um, and in fact, they've made proposals in the past as to how it would be entirely possible to, uh, to fund those changes through private sector investment. Um, but what I would say is that um, Sir John Armit made some very wise recommendations about how we can boost investment in infrastructure uh, through the National Infrastructure Commission. And we, um, we published our response to his recommendations and, and we're accepting the vast majority of them. You've set out how your reforms aim to make UK infrastructure more attractive to outside investors by making the planning process faster. But many of us who know how our local planning authorities work know that there isn't enough resource, nor are there enough planning inspectors available uh, to make the system work even at a reasonable level. So the delays are ridiculous. But you've cut funding to local authorities in real terms, essentially, to pay for your tax cuts. How is that going to help solve the planning problems? Well. Um you're absolutely right that planning departments need more resources and that's why there and what, what I having talked to lots of businesses uh, they said that they would be very happy to pay higher fees for their planning applications if they knew they were going to get a prompt response so we're introducing a new service which allows local authorities to charge the cost of processing an application at cost so that they can get extra resources in um, but um, they are then obliged to deliver the answer within the statutory framework and if they don't they have to give the money back and process the application free of charge. So we're, we're directly addressing that issue. That will mean that they can put more resources into their planning department, <coughs> which I agree with you, we urgently need. And the shortage of planning inspectors, that's not going to be solved overnight? Well, Do you have plans it, it's to not going to be that? solved overnight, but what I announced in the autumn statement will mean a significant increase in the funding going into planning departments that means they can process those large business planning applications much more quickly. We also um, going to uh, we're going to reduce as a result of that the average time it takes to process a large planning application to two and a half years and we're going to reduce 90 percent of the delay in access to the national grid. So taken together those measures have been strongly welcomed by the clean energy industry as, as one of the single biggest things that we could do to um, speed up their investment in infrastructure. Can you confirm um, to the committee that you decided in your autumn statement to spend 96% of the extra money that um, the, the headroom that uh, you, you got from changes to the forecasts on tax cuts be it for um, in NICs and full expense and, and other things, well, leaving way, yourself very little fiscal headroom to meet your rules? Um, the way, well first of all, the, the headroom to debt falling has doubled compared to the spring budget. Um, to 13 and we're meeting our, billion. Yeah, but yeah. it was six and a half billion in the spring. Um, <coughs> secondly, what I would say is this, I used most of the extra headroom I generated from the economy outperforming <coughs> forecasts uh, on growth measures. Yes, uh, they were cuts in taxation. They're cuts in taxation that help growth, that help uh, get more people into the national labour force, which helps businesses fill their vacancies, 
Uh, they're measures that help reform the welfare system by giving more support to help people back into work. They're measures that help stimulate business investment by giving us the most attractive uh, capital allowances, business and investment tax regime in the world. Yes, and I don't apologise for that. It was the right thing to do because if we want to fund our public services, uh, then we need to be a dynamic, lightly regulated, low-tax economy. So half of your fiscal headroom is that assumption that is always in the budget documents that the um, fuel duty escalator is going to be applied. So are you going to be doing that? Because if you don't apply the fuel duty escalator, your headroom is halved back to where it was in March. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until the spring budget before I'm able to answer that question. Don't you think it would be easier for and, and more um, acceptable for all concerned if measures such as that that never get applied get taken out of the scorecard? Well, if they are a permanent measure, then they should be described as such, but that is something that is not a permanent measure. Um, I was very pleased we were able to roll it over this year. Um, and we will uh, look at that decision again in the run-up to the spring budget. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, I believe that we have a bit of time uh, for a second chance for some colleagues. So, uh, Danny. Thanks very much. I just want to talk briefly about regional spending and growth. It's very encouraging that you've been able to double the investment in investment zones and. Uh, I feel very jealous uh, of, of, for the, uh, of the uh, local leaders in the combined authorities with their single funding settlements and so on. I feel jealous on behalf of Wiltshire. All these places claim to be the you know, new headquarters of advanced manufacturing. That seems to be the thing that attracts your support. Wiltshire's an amazing centre of advanced manufacturing and agri-tech and all sorts of other innovations, but it's just one little local authority. What are we doing as a government to support growth at a more local level than these large combined authorities and particularly in rural areas? Well, um, the first thing I would say is that there is a very conscious strategy to spread growth more evenly from uh, prosperous parts of the country to less prosperous parts of the country. And since we started the levelling up agenda, and more than two thirds of new jobs have been created outside London and the South East. And I think that's a good thing. Um, it's good for social stability, but it's actually good for the economy because if you look at one of the reasons why our productivity has been held back, it is because there's a much bigger difference in, for example, the productivity of the Manchester and London economies than there is between the economies of Lyon and Paris, yeah. um, and we need to address that. But we should never underestimate the, uh, the growth potential of uh, counties like Wiltshire or indeed counties like Surrey. And um, one of the things that we've decided to do, Michael Gove and I together, is uh, to wind up the, uh, the LEPs and to give yeah. the, that responsibility back to uh, upper tier authorities because we think they are in a better position to promote economic growth, mainly because they have control over things like planning. So a lot of economic growth is related to planning decisions. And we think it's important that we align incentives. So I'm in favour of more devolution and more responsibility and accountability yeah. for economic growth. They don't have enough control over planning because the inspectors apply crazy rules that override local authorities' wishes and local communities' wishes. But that's a question for another day and another uh, Secretary of State, perhaps. One thing they do control is, uh, is, is, is their budgets that they receive from you, but they are required, naturally and appropriately, to finance the social care requirements, particularly of elderly people. 60% of the Wiltshire local authority budget goes on adult social care. I appreciate and support and welcome the investment that you have made, another £3 billion most recently, into social care. So I think there's important support coming, but fundamentally the system as a whole doesn't work, and we were elected on a manifesto commitment to reform that. What can we do to reassure our constituents that we are going to fix the you know, deep structural challenges in social care, not least so that local authorities can have some more money to spend on other things? Well, um, uh, thank you for mentioning what I announced at the autumn statement. I mean, I felt uh, that when I secured a big funding increase for the NHS in uh, 2018, um, I wanted to do it for social care as well. 
and um, I was not able to do so because I moved to a different job. Mm. And so when I became Chancellor, it was unfinished business. And in fact, the increase uh, it was £2.8 billion increase from where they were before this year and going up to £4.7 billion next year, mm. which I think is something, it's, it's a 25% plus mm. increase in the core adult social care budget, so it's a big increase. But with that additional funding needs to come reform and I very much hope that is something we will see um, and it's something that I hope I can work with uh, the new mm. Health Secretary uh, on to deliver because I agree with you, it's, it's, it's an area where we need to see more integration with the NHS and indeed more reform. Health and Social Care Secretary. Indeed. Yes. Thank you. Um, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to uh, ask you about tax avoidance and HMRC funding, Chancellor. Uh, HMRC has been allocated £163 million to manage and settle their debts. Um, HMRC have had outstanding tax debts for, debts for a number of years now, with the latest data showing that this stood at £45.9 billion in March. So why are you only giving them additional funding now? Um, I think, just to use our favourite word, Mr Henry, co the context of this is that the tax gap in this um, country is much lower than most of our international comparator countries. Um, but uh, in every fiscal event that I've done, I've prioritised giving extra resources to HMRC because I think it's absolutely fundamental that people pay the taxes that they're owed. So when it came to COVID fraud, uh, we've had a thousand people at HMRC working on this and they've, uh, I think, raised 1.6, they've got 1.6 billion pounds back. Um, and uh, I think we've had 81 arrests and there are 50 criminal cases uh, being undergone. But I've always, um, we allocated more resources uh, to, um, to tackling this issue at this spring budget and I will continue to do so whenever HMRC make a good case. I think a lot of people would suggest that there's still a lot uh, to be done and that's actually a bit of a drop in the ocean. But let's just move, you, you talked about allocating additional resources to HMRC. No additional resources have been provided for either HMRC's compliance or customer service functions. HMRC recently told us that the department's struggling to meet its customer service co targets, basic stuff such as answering the phone and dealing with correspondence. And this is in part due to fiscal drag, which will know all about bringing more people into the tax system. So why did you not, why did you choose not to increase HMRC's funding for these functions? Um, I actually had uh, discussions with the head of HMRC about their failure to meet customer service targets and my understanding is that they are actually uh, on track to meet those targets uh, even if they're not meeting them now. Um, but um, I'm it's not very. What they've told us recently. Let me let me write to you and oh, okay. uh, give you the full update on that. Okay, the full context, I should say. Let me ask you then: Has HMRC outlined any risks to you on the correct collection of taxes, including uh, how it helps HMRC's customers uh, from its lack of resources? Um, what I think I can assure you is that. Um, when I've had requests from HMRC to increase the number of people uh, that they need to tackle um, taxes that should be paid, that aren't being paid, uh, we have responded very sympathetically. But the question I'm asking is about resources for dealing with uh, people are trying to contact, contact HMRC. Yes. Are you as Chancellor uh, content for more people not to be able to get in touch with HMRC either by uh, phone or letter? No. Um, and I've had a discussion with the head of HMRC about that and he has assured me that they have plans in place that will improve the quality of customer service. And yet you've applied no additional resource to these functions? Uh, well my understanding is that they will be able to uh, meet their customer service targets with the resources they have. You're not concerned then uh, about HMRC's ability to collect taxes without additional funding then? Uh, I've, these, I've, given, sorry, I, I've given them extra resources to help in, them collect more areas. taxes. Not in these areas, Chancellor, uh, in terms well, of customer no, service. Uh, in terms of customer service, yeah. that is their service to customers who are contacting HMRC yeah. about uh, their tax bill and there I believe that, that they are on track too. to improve their customer service. I don't think that's a question of resource. 
Uh, I think that the management of that service is improving. Um, I, obviously, I said to you, I'll write to you with some more details on that, but I had a meeting with the head of HMRC about that. But when it comes to chasing up taxes yeah. uh, that aren't being paid, that should be paid, where very often people don't contact us because they don't want any contact with us because they're not paying taxes they should, that's when we contact them, well, and there I very much have increased resources. I'm sure we await that information with bated breath, given the recent conversations we've had with HMRC. That must have been a miraculous change in performance. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can just give you a little bit more yeah. information from, um, yeah. from Will McFarlane. Uh, you've made the exchange on resources, but just to the Chancellor's previous point about public sector efficiency and productivity, um, uh, we've also announced in this autumn statement the government's plans to remove the, high, the threshold for um, uh, high income employees to submit a self assessment tax return. So, this is one of the points about individuals being in HMRC processes when they don't need to be because they don't need to go through self-assessment, there was previously an income uh, trigger to enter self-assessment. The government is um, streamlining that, and that's just one of the ways, not with additional resources, but trying to improve the customer interface between HMRC and the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I think our colleagues have got a couple more, and then I've got a few uh, final ones myself. Uh, Dame Angela. Thank you very much. Um, the Equality Act suggests that um, all government pronouncements should have a gender um, a, a statement on the effect on women of the policy, but there's no gender analysis of the budget. Why is that? Um, well, all the measures in the budget are checked as they are required to be under the law for equality's impact, including the impact on women. Um, and when it comes to individual policies that I approve, um, I sign off that I have noted the equality's impact of individual policies. But um, might it not help debate an understanding of what can sometimes be quite technical areas but that can have a very important um, impact on women if there was actually a, a, a gender analysis published with your budget uh, papers? Um, well, Sounds like you've got one in there somewhere, you've just not published it. We, we, we assess as we're required to the equality's impact of every individual measure. So there's a very thorough process and it's not just women, it's for all, um, all protected groups of protected characteristics. Um, so that process does happen. It would be nice if it could be more transparent and talking about that, um, in your own distribution al analysis which you did publish, you grouped together all the policy announcements since the 2022 autumn statement. Why did you pick that particular year? I note that it shows that the distributional analysis from 2022 is, um, helps those on, in, on, in lower income deciles, but actually the announcements you've made in this um, fiscal event are the other way around. They give more to those who are um, higher up the uh, income uh, decile. Well, I think that's a logical place to start when you're talking about a group of fiscal events because that's when the pandemic was over and that's when we you know when we started a new chapter in terms of our economic program in terms of the measures i announced uh, a week ago uh, at the autumn statement uh, the point i would make is that the the bulk of our effort uh, is to help people on low incomes the biggest single change you know the increase in the national living wage um, has uh, a huge impact on people being paid the lowest legally payable wage if they're um, above a certain age. And, you know, that, that I think will make a big difference. And the national insurance cut um, combines, uh, focuses Which obviously its effort national on people insurance on... isn't paid always by those who are on lower No, and for, for those, for people who are Less below £12,570, we had an increase in benefits at double next year's predicted inflation. State pension is going up by th nearly three times next year's predicted inflation. Well, if it's Local so housing allowance is £800. To why didn't you publish a distribution analysis of the autumn statement then, rather than take it back to year zero, which seems to be 2022? Because, because I would like the impact of my decisions to be taken in the round over a group of fiscal events, because I think that's a fairer reflection of my record and this government's record. Thank you, Chair. And Chair Bowen? And a very interesting comment, Chancellor, because if we look at a, a group of women particularly finding it difficult financially, 
uh, lone mothers. Uh, the Women's Budget Group uh, suggests that the national insurance changes for lone mothers will benefit them by £76 a year, um, contributions compared to £248 uh, a year for a lone father and 437 a year for a dual parent household. So perhaps analysis might inform you as much as the rest of us. Well, um, if you look at the measures that I announced in the spring budget, uh, which, in, which included a £4 billion annual increase in childcare, that will make an absolutely huge difference for lone mothers who choose to work. And I make no apology in my decisions for prioritising measures that encourage and make it easier and break down barriers for people who want to work. Um, I think there is still challenge about whether those uh, childcare measures will actually uh, be able to be implemented given the age profile and the state of the childcare sector, uh, but clearly lone mothers are not doing as well as other groups um, in terms of national ins the national insurance changes you've made. And if we, you seem to have become a fan of Torsten Bell. Um, They're all fans of Torsten Bell. It's a bit of a surprise the Chancellor is such a fan, <laughs> but perhaps... Without always agreeing with him, I have to say. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps he, perhaps you would like to, to think about uh, one of his co quotes that you didn't uh, mention today, which was about the impact of the national insurance, um, the disparities between those on the highest and lowest incomes. Those in the richest fifth of households will be £1,000 better off on average in 2027-28 from these changes, much higher than those in the lowest fifth who took, look set to gain just £200. I will happily reflect on that if you will reflect on what Torsten Bell said in the spring budget about my plans. No, no, I'm, I'm just I'm answering your question. Uh, I'm not asking you a question. I said I will happily reflect on that if you will reflect on uh, what he said about the decision to pay uh, people on universal credit, childcare in advance to enable them to look for work which they had not been able to do previously because it was paid in arrears, which will have a particular impact on loan mothers. I find it absolutely amazing that you would want to be praised uh, for paying childcare in advance to people who are on universal credit, when surely uh, it was mad to think you could be able to pay childcare in arrears in the first place. Well, to quote Mr Hendry's favourite word, I was just giving you the context of Torsten Bell's overall comments <laughs> on the measures that I've taken. Yeah, it, it would take somebody who didn't know a great deal to introduce that in universal credit in the first place. I'm going to move things slightly on and I promise I'm not going to quote uh, Torsten Bell in this section. Be <laughs> but um, I'm going to wrap up with a few things that uh, colleagues uh, haven't raised but I think will be uh, of interest. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first one was to echo, uh, on behalf of w Wiltshire uh, experiencing Thanks. adult social care pressures, Worcestershire also uh, flagged that to me, as well as the home to school transport uh, pressures in uh, a large rural area. I am assuming the local government settlement announcement will come this side of Christmas, will it, Chancellor? Um, that is the normal practice. Um, it's obviously in the end for Michael Gove to confirm when the precise date is. But conversations are ongoing between your teams and his? Correct. Okay. Uh, it's not going to be as late as next February because it wasn't till February this year, was it? I can't give you the, the exact okay. date, but, uh, but you know, discussions are ongoing. Okay, thank you. Um, on the subject of dates, um, we note that the temporary 5p off the price of fuel expires next uh, March the 23rd. Can we infer from your comments today that you don't like temporary reliefs, uh, that that's just going to be allowed to lapse, or can we infer that we might have a budget before that date? Um, I don't like temporary reliefs. Uh, I, I, I think and it's something that is permanent should be described as permanent. That is a temporary relief um, and we will make a decision on that when we have uh, the spring budget, the date for which has not been decided. 
it hasn't been decided, but it's <coughs> likely to be before March the 23rd. Are we incorrect in suspecting that? Um, I'm afraid I can't tell you anything okay. about the date of the next budget right. because it genuinely Thank has not been decided. Okay. Um, on uh, the subject of simplification of the tax system, as you know, this committee has a strong view that it was a mistake to have abolished the Office for Simplification. We acknowledge that you've simplified a few things in the, your time as Chancellor, for example, um, the, the, the pension lifetime allowance, uh, some NICS measures at this budget. Um, but do you accept there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of simplification of the tax system, the, the sort of high marginal tax rates there are at various points on the income uh, scale, uh, the cliff edges uh, that exist that are going to be uh, capturing more and more people as time goes by and incomes grow faster than inflation uh, again. So what are your thoughts on simplification generally, Chancellor? Um, it's something that I, I always try to uh, practice in every fiscal event that I'm responsible for. Um, and I think I have done some major simplifications, as you generously commented on, um, and I would hope to continue in that vein. I, I agree with you, by the way, there is lots more simplification there we need to really do. There is really perverse... Yes, um, no, I, I, I accept that there is lots of simplification that is necessary. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unless uh, colleagues are wishing to catch my eye out on anything else, I think we've covered a lot of ground in uh, this afternoon's scrutiny of the autumn statement. I think you've committed to write to us on the details around um, the aerated concrete issue and what you're hearing from the Department of Education on that and, and investment companies. And investment companies. Um, so we will obviously be in touch in terms of the outstanding issues but uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues can I thank you very much uh, for your evidence this afternoon. Order, order. Thank you very much.